1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. I got into a discussion that sort of brought me to studying this particular passage and, and thinking about it. I think it's very appropriate. The only real lead up that you need to have to this particular Bible story is that Jesus and his disciples are doing what they typically do in the gospel narratives, and that's they're traveling around from town to town, and Jesus is teaching people. So in their travels, as you can imagine, there's quite a few times where they need a place to stay, and that's exactly what happens in this one particular story. So let's go ahead and look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 52 through 56. And it says, And he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him, because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. And I know that, just like every other human being, I'm, I'm susceptible to the things that are going on around me, and, and that's the reason that I felt that this lesson was very appropriate. In that little episode with the gospel, uh, in, in the Gospel of Luke with John and James, I find it really, really fascinating because here they are going around this area in Judea, and uh, they're coming to a village of Samaritans. And I'm not going to go into a whole history lesson about why the Samaritans and the Jews really don't like each other, but suffice it to say that that was about as tense as it gets. Now, right now we are at a time in this country, and I understand that there are a lot of hurt feelings, there's a lot of bad history, a lot of bad blood, and, and a lot of things that, even though I think that there's a, a good deal of it that is somewhat manufactured for political purposes, there's a lot of it that's not. There's a lot of it that's legitimate. And, and we all know and understand that. Like, if you look back through history with the civil rights movement and look back even further with things like uh, slavery, Jim Crow, so on and so forth... We understand those things. Every reasonable, rational person understands that regardless of, of whether you think it's still going on today, and I happen to be of the opinion that it's by the, the vast majority uh, of, by, by any logical measure, it's really not going on very much today as it was then, regardless of whether you hold that position like I do. You understand the underlying reason why that animosity or that distrust would be there. And you know what? With the Samaritans and the Jews, some of the bad blood between them was 100% legitimate too. And if you look at this passage, I think it's interesting because the Bible doesn't waste any words. And it goes out of its way to point a couple of things out. It doesn't just say that the village of the Samaritans rejected him. It says that they rejected to give the disciples of Jesus and Jesus himself any kind of shelter or room and board for the night because they were traveling to Jerusalem. So what does that mean? It means that the Samaritans didn't want them in their town because they were Jewish. Now remember, Samaritans are kind of like half-breeds that are part Jewish and part something else, but the Jews, I mean, sometimes pretty horribly, had persecuted them, and they had persecuted the Jews, and there's just a lot of bad blood between these two tribes. And because of that, these people are traveling to Jerusalem, and the Samaritans are like, uh, no, you guys can sleep outside for all we care. You can stick it. Go somewhere else. I mean, of course, I'm adding my own flair there, but that's essentially what happened. They wouldn't even allow these people to sleep in their town because they were Jews. 
James and John's reaction is fascinating to me. Because these are two people, disciples of Christ, at Christ's side all the time. John is referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loves. He's the one whom Jesus himself handpicked to take care of his mom when he died. He's about as close to Jesus as anybody. And it's really kind of unclear. Luke is the most chronological of, of all the Gospels. But because, you know, it's, it's covering three years and just a few chapters, and we don't really have a whole lot on Jesus' life, uh, we don't know exactly when in the ministry this happened, but it probably wasn't super early. It probably wasn't really close to the crucifixion either. But my point in all of that is, James and John have been traveling with Jesus for a while. They knew the deal. They'd been listening to his teachings. And yet their reaction when this happens to them, and they were justified, I think, to some degree in being upset. Because not only have they been rejected from this town, they've been rejected from this town because of racism. Now think about that. And then James and John's reaction is, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and have this entire town destroyed? I'm assuming, if this is any kind of normal town, that there are women and children and innocent people in that town. James and John had a legitimate claim to being persecuted against because of their race. And what was their reaction? Burn it all down. Take out everybody. Whether they were racist against us or not, let's just get the entire village, wipe it off the face of the map, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, James and John were Jews. Do you think that they were thrilled about sleeping in a Samaritan town? Do you think that they that was their first choice? Now, maybe there weren't other options around and they felt desperate. Maybe they were just being super magnanimous and decided, hey, this one's nearby, we'll ask them. And uh, you know what? We'll even be the bigger person. We'll even go into this town, even though they're Samaritans and we don't like them, we'll be the big magnanimous people that come in and are like, you know what? It's okay. Do you see how much pride is going on in the hearts of James and John here? Because I think reading this passage, the indication that is given here, and I don't know exactly where their mind was beforehand, but I think that this is a, a pretty good, plausible explanation as to why their reaction is so over the top. The way that they're looking at it is, look, we were already deciding to be the bigger person, and you know what, we'll even be nice enough to stay in your town. And then they were immediately slighted and, and spat upon, basically. I mean, I'm, I'm meaning that figuratively, of course, even though that really did happen to Jesus later in the, uh, in the gospel. And they just rejected him and turned them out and didn't want anything to do with them. And so I think maybe they had already psyched themselves up and put themselves in the mindset and it's like, look at me, I'm going to be so generous and magnanimous that even I, a Jew, who is clearly better than those Samaritans, I'm just willing to put that aside and, and stay in their town. And then the Samaritans are like, yeah, we don't want nothing to do with y'all. You're, you're Jews. Do you see a parallel here? Do you see that what is going on here could somewhat be equated to what's going on with the riots. That James and John have a legitimate claim to being racially persecuted here. And their reaction is, let's just take out the whole town. We don't care who we hurt. I see a pretty strong parallel between those two things. And I'm in no way trying to do that to somehow condone the violence that's been going on in this country around the, the protests and whatnot. In fact, I'm doing the exact opposite. That's the position that James and John took. Meditate on that for a second. That's who they were in that moment. And Jesus immediately rebukes them. He immediately looks at them and goes like, uh, you have the 180 degree opposite spirit of what you're supposed to have. He says, and this is the actual quote, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. 
I didn't come to destroy life, I came to save it. That's a powerful moment for Jesus. It's a powerful moment for his disciples. Even when they had legitimate claims of being aggrieved for something as petty as the fact that they were Jews and the other guys were Samaritans and they didn't like them because of their race, the, the outrage was understandable. The reaction was not. Because I'm sure Jesus has is, is got to be sitting there thinking like, have you guys not listened to a word I've said this whole time? Have you not been paying attention when I'm going out and giving sermons? You missed that part about turning the other cheek. Did you fall asleep during that one? But that's who James and John were. They were like these filthy Samaritans. And here's the other part of that too, because they had some racial animosity within themselves as well. Not, I think, unlike the people that are rioting and breaking things and smashing windows. Uh, some of them are even doing so to black neighborhoods and black-owned businesses and specifically saying, oh, well, the, the white bank owners own them. How do they know that the bank owner is white? But they're, they're like, oh, that, that's all controlled by the white banks, and that's really white money. We don't really even care that the owner is, is a black person and they're going to have to deal with this. See, that level of outrage brings you to a level of irrationality, and that's exactly what happens to James and John in this exact moment. James and John look at this, and they react basically the same way that these rioters do. And you have to think about it this way. This town, what they did was not, you know, not only was it racially motivated, but they also rejected the Lord and Savior. And Jesus, the one whom they've rejected, is like, yeah, that, that's not the way that we are. That's not what we're supposed to be about. We're supposed to love people. We're supposed to try to save life. We're supposed to bring the gospel to people. We're not here to destroy everybody that doesn't like us. That's not the role that my father sent me here for. And so when you understand that aspect of it, you have to remember that, too, there's some racial animosity coming from James and John as well. That they're looking at this and do you really think that they would have had exactly the same reaction if this were a town of, of Israelites? Like, do you think that if a town, and by the way, I'm sure this happened to the multiple times on the travels. I don't know if it had happened before this event, but just looking at the gospel narrative and the way that Jesus was treated throughout all of Galilee and, and that region, I got to believe that there were town of Israelites that probably did the same thing. They did probably didn't do so because they were Jews because they would have been Jews too. But you got to believe that there were Israelites and, and towns that just ran them out. Do you think that James and John went, hey, Jesus, you want to just wipe this one off the map? I don't think they would have done that unless it were a Samaritan town. And so here you have two parties, on the one side, James and John, on the other side, the Samaritan village, that have some deep-seated racial hatred for one another. And James and John, probably even trying to do the right thing at the onset, have a ridiculous overreaction to being treated wrongly based on their race. And Jesus rebukes them immediately and says, no, that's wrong. That is not how you react to that. Because Jesus understood a very simple concept. You can not beat hatred with anything other than love. And to illustrate this, let's just look at John himself. Let's go to the gospel or let's go to the book, sorry, of 1 John chapter 2 verses 9 through 11. Where it states, "The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness." and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. That's the same man. That same John, that when a group of Samaritans discriminate against him because of his race, his immediate reaction is, let's just bring down fire from heaven, burn up the entire village, women, children, whatever, let's just wipe them off the face of the earth just like Sodom and Gomorrah. 
that's John then, and you just read the words that John himself wrote through inspiration in the book of 1 John years later. How do you get there? How do you go from that to any man that hates his brother walks in darkness and the light is not in him? How do you make that transition? There's only one way to do it. There's always only been one way to do that. And that is by meditating upon the teachings of Jesus Christ. Maybe what Jesus had been teaching up until that point hadn't quite 100% sunk in, and that's a human problem. That's something that happens to people that have been members of the church for 60, 70, 80 years from time to time. We're human beings, we're flawed, it happens. I get that. But over time, daily meditating, thinking about the words of Christ, the teachings that he gave people, talking about how we're all God's children, that he created all of us, that there is in no, there's no division in the kingdom of heaven between Jews and Greeks and Samaritans, that all are supposed to come to repentance through him. That's the only way a person's heart can change that much. There's just not another force on this planet that can do that. And that's illustrated pretty well. In fact, you may remember that if you've read that entire chapter there in 1 John 2, he actually ends that chapter, spends the majority of the, the latter part of that chapter talking about the family of the church. Talking about other people who, by the point that, that 1 John is written, is wildly diverse, that includes not only Jews and Samaritans, but Gentiles, Romans, all kinds of different things. And he talks about each of them as their family and saying, anybody that does not see it that way is walking in darkness. Why is John able to say that? Because that was him. He was that guy. The guy that didn't even mind taking out innocent people because they had wronged him on the basis of his race. And yet he has the strength to, years later, after daily diving into the teachings of Jesus Christ and living in the love of Jesus, say something like, anybody that hates his brother has no part in the kingdom of heaven. That is a transformation that only the blood of Christ can make. Remember that John's also the apostle that is the only one that includes the woman in the well, a Samaritan woman, that includes that story in his gospel. John understood this because he understood the transformation that took place in his own life. It wasn't theory to him. It wasn't some kind of theological exercise. He was a changed man. And if you want that kind of salvation, if you want that kind of turnaround in your life, I'm telling you right now, there's only one place to do it, and that's the teachings of Christ. Stay the course, friends. My mother always said, if you can't say something nice about somebody, then you're probably talking about a leftist. Nah, I kid. But seriously, it would really help me out if you would like this video and subscribe to my channel. I'm sure my mom would appreciate it.